It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question uh, to the Minister of uh, Finance. Um, Minister, about two months ago, I sat down with Premier Wynne, and we agreed to clear the decks of legislation uh, because she said that was standing in the way of putting forward a jobs plan. Yeah. Now, two months later, we That's see no jobs plan, but we saw significant layoffs, like 800 jobs permanently lost at Heinz and Leamington, 170 jobs at CCL and Penetanguishing and Simcoe, and abandonment of the Ring of Fire project. You know, I, I hate to say this, um, but I regret trusting the Premier to put forward that jobs plan. I guess by now, I should know not to trust Liberals, but the greater regret I have is the fact that people have now lost their jobs, 38,000 manufacturing jobs, since she became Premier. Oh, so question. let me ask you this. We've got two weeks left in the session. Are we finally going to see your jobs plan, or are we going to see more jobs leave the province of Ontario? Let's see what we have. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Appreciate the question from the Leader of the Opposition because it's high time that that side of the House supports small business by supporting the act that we provided. And that's being stalled by that member and his party. We have a a three-part jobs plan. Order. If you read the fall economic statement, it talks about what it is we're doing to create those jobs. And as a result of asking for a blanket order is not suffice, so I will return to people's writings. Carry on. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as a result of uh, the, the, the jobs plan that we have and we've been pursuing over the last number of years, we've made strategic investments in our province to withstand the recession, and we've weathered it better than most jurisdictions around the world and here in North America, for that matter. And the member opposite should embrace the strong fundamentals that exist in Ontario yes, and the hardworking families and businesses that invest in this province. We will continue to support them. So thank should you. you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Good. You, you know, uh, sometimes I worry, Speaker, that the finance minister is little more than a, a nice suit, a nice smile, and a briefing book. Uh, it seems to have no depth of understanding um, on these issues, and no wonder we're in deep trouble. Um, minister, you say that uh, your Bill 105 would have saved jobs at Heinz and at CCL. I will remind you that you're actually increasing taxes for medium and large employers if the payroll is more than $5 million. So correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't Bill 105 actually have increased taxes on companies the size of Heinz and CCL? Do you know your own legislation? Well, there you have it, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite does not want to support an exemption to employer health tax that will save 90 percent of all small businesses in this province not to be paying that tax. 90 percent of businesses in Ontario would be exempt from that tax. The member opposite is now saying that he wouldn't support that initiative. 60,000 more small businesses would be exempt as a result of these initiatives. From Renfrew, and it's true, order. Mr. Speaker, $7,500 would be paid by big corporations. And I've spoken to some of those corporations who see no problem whatsoever in supporting these initiatives. You should be supporting it as well. Well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. <laughs> well, I guess the minister didn't have a briefing note uh, on that topic. You know that your bill actually increases taxes. So let's think of some of the losses, sadly, we've seen. CCL, Kellogg's, John Deere, Heinz, CAT. All of those would have had a tax increase on Bill 105. So, Minister, I I'm going to ask you to move beyond the briefing notes and actually answer from the heart. I've got a plan that will actually get hydro rates under control so businesses will invest again in our province. I've got a plan to get taxes down to encourage investment in a new machine, a new product line, and hire men and women again. I've got a plan to clear aside the red tape, the hassle, the runaround to reduce the regulatory burden by at least a third. I've got a plan to put people into good jobs they can count on, middle class comfort and security, permanent jobs, not temporary job to temporary jobs. I've got a plan, so let's get going. All I ask is, where the hell is yours? <laughs> I would uh, ask. I would ask the leader to withdraw. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. 
The member opposite wants us to speak from the heart. And I can tell you this. The plan that's being provided and proposed by the member opposite is a slash-and-burn policy that's going to create havoc and make it very difficult for our economy to grow and, more importantly, to sustain those businesses. The member opposite makes claims about increased taxes. The fact of the matter is supporting small businesses. In the end, the net result is that it's not fully offset, and we do recognize that we need to create more jobs and to, to, to build our, our, um, our economy. But this is their plan, Mr. Speaker. Their plan calls to fire 10,000 education workers. Their plan calls to fire 2,000 health care workers. Their plan will cancel infrastructure projects across the province. They will drive down wages with their harmful right to work, less legislation. Thank you. Their plan is to fight, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Uh, no question. Thank you. Um, back to the, um, the finance minister. I mean, what, what a pathetic answer the finance minister. Three chances to tell us what his plan is, or at least when it's forthcoming. You know, I, I, I take part of the blame myself. I did trust you. I trusted the premier to bring forward a jobs plan when I said I would clear the decks. But let me tell you what's happened since. So 800 men and women lose their jobs in Leamington, Ontario. Heinz ketchup that had made in Ontario for 100 years will now be made in the United States of America. It's devastating those communities. We saw CCL on Friday laying off, closing down 170 jobs in Penetang machine. The ring of fire is gone. So when Leamington lost that environment, that job creation dynamo in Heights, what was your response? You brought forward legislation to ban smoking on patios. When we lost the Ring of Fire project, what was your response? To get Al Gore to pat you on the back for the very same policies that drove hydro rates through the roof. When are you going to bring forward a plan, or is it simply time, Speaker, to change the team that leads, to put forward a jobs plan, Thank and to you. put men and women back into good paying jobs and live? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Mr. Finance. You didn't get the memo this morning. So, Mr. Speaker, our plan has been clearly laid out in our fall economic statement. Unlike the member opposite, we believe that we need to make those investments in our people. We recognize there's a skills shortage amongst certain sectors of our economy that we have attracted. We need to fill them. That's why we need to invest in them. We also recognize that we need to invest in modern infrastructure. Those strategic in initiatives Will, high, will enable us to have 100,000 more new jobs in the province. And we will also do everything possible to maintain a dynamic business climate by maintaining our tax systems low relative to the other jurisdictions around North America and the world. The fact of the matter is there is investment coming to Ontario. The fact of the matter is we have over 470,000 net new jobs since the recession. Answer. The fact of the matter is the initiatives that we've taken are working. And the member opposite doesn't see the need to make those investments, and that's worrisome, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. <clears throat> well, I, I'm not going to argue that the finance minister has added 300,000 jobs to the government payroll. I just think we need a healthy, thriving private sector to rebuild our middle class, and if it works, they pay taxes for health and education. The problem is, that I, I, I believe you've got this in your briefing binder somewhere. We've lost 38,000 manufacturing jobs under Premier Wynne alone. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs under the McGuinty Wynn government. This is our middle class. I remember growing up in the north end of Fort Erie on Lindbergh Drive. Most of the moms and dads of my friends, they worked at the factory. They worked at the plant. It built our middle class. It was a backbone of communities that I call home. You've broken that background. You hollowed out our manufacturing sector, and you haven't got a clue how to turn it around. We do. Get energy rates under control. Get taxes down. Clear aside the regulatory barriers. Modernize our labour laws. We've got a plan for 300,000 manufacturing jobs to rebuild our communities. Thank I you. ask you, why don't you? Thank you. Mr. Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, this is not about more government. In fact, our government has been scaling down the size of government. It's about more opportunity, opportunity that the opposition member is trying to take away. That is their claim to their purpose. Take it away while some of the other members of the House want to just give it away. We have to be cognizant and balance in our approach. And here, I'll, I'll read something that a member of the Conservative Party, who was the leader of that party, says. He says, 
And I quote, there are business people who will say the last thing we need right now is a sort of war between the unions and businesses exactly. or the government in an economy that is just slowly recovering. Oh, I happen to believe they are right. I don't think it's, a cons it's constructive right now. He says further, I think it's probably the wrong thing to be advocating, and I don't even Answer. think it's going to be that good for the economy. That's John Tory, who opposes oh, individuals who want to fight unions, Mr. Speaker. We've got to work collaboratively in partnership. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. You know, I, um, I pointed out my opening question that two months ago that I put my trust in Premier Wynne and the Liberals to bring forward a jobs plan. Two months later, we've lost more jobs. It seems like daily there's sad news across our province and more layoffs. And after five questions, Speaker, the finance minister does nothing but play silly games. He has not brought forward any kind of jobs plan. I fear that he won't as we head into the Christmas break in three weeks' time. So when we look at your legislative agenda, you found importance in who can access a tanning bed. You found importance around water cooler salesmen. You found importance of whether you can smoke on a patio or not. My priority, jobs, getting our economy moving again, getting hydro rates under control. So is this the extent of your legislative agenda? And if it is, let me ask you, which one of those bills, the tanning bed, the smoking legislation, uh, or they were on the water heaters, which one of those would have made cliffs Russia. and the ring of fire a reality to fire up our economy? Which one of your plans would have helped bring good, well-paying jobs to northern Ontario, southern Ontario, Thank and you. to the oil sands in the province of Ontario come to Thank job? You. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me respond by, by advising the member who obviously hasn't read the fall economic statement or the budget previously. We have a three-point plan to invest in people by creating a youth job strategy. That's $275 million for 30,000 more jobs. We are advocating for our seniors and our consumers by fighting for their protection. We're investing $35 billion over the next three years by building infrastructure. We're bringing forward green bonds and a new Trillium Trust. We're promoting our AFP process. We're investing in our electricity grid that they neglected for so many years, Mr. Speaker, so that we can be competitive. We are investing in our business climate. We're cutting taxes on small business, and we brought forward legislation this fall, Bill 105. That will help small businesses. You now are saying that you're not supporting it. Say that to your business people and how they feel that the opposition who claim to fight for small business is now creating and stalling its ability. Question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Acting P Premier. People worried about finding good jobs in this province were dismayed to see yet another company walk away from Ontario last week. Can the Acting Premier tell us what deal the government made with Clips Natural Resources and whether the government held up to their end of that deal, Speaker? Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, the opportunities in the Ring of Fire and in our mineral deposits in the far north are tremendous, and we will continue to support and do everything possible to invest in that initiative. There are a number of proponents that are continuing to be interested in the development of the Ring of Fire. We are going to continue to do what's necessary. We have established a development corporation to that effect. We have a number of proponents. and. We're asking the federal government to partner in these initiatives, as they should, the same way they've done it for Alberta and for New Brunswick and Newfoundland. We have to make certain that we invest in those initiatives, and we will, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, in May 2012, uh, rather, the finance minister confirmed that the Ontario government had reached an initial or initial agreement or a term sheet with Cliffs regarding plans to process. Uh, chromite in Capriol. Will the Acting Premier make that agreement public today? So, Mr. Speaker, um, the proponent that uh, has been involved in the negotiation, there have been others, has made their decision. It's, uh, it's going to be continuing. We are, as a government, will continue to seek the best value for Ontarians. We're asking the federal government to partner with us. We want to ensure that we do the smelting and the fabricating of the, re the, the mineral resources so we can produce stainless steel here in Ontario. 
All of this is part of our ability to, uh, to take advantage of the far north. We also want to be able to work effectively and collaboratively with the First Nations and the Aboriginal peoples that are affected by this initiative. That's why we also need the federal government to partner with us. We'll continue to drive forward. We'll continue to look what's necessary to provide for an all-weather road and a spine to the north Answer. to enable that development, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to do our part. Okay. Final supplementary. Speaker, in May 2012, the government reached a term sheet with Cliffs Natural Resources. The question I'm asking is, can the acting premier at least, if they're not going to tell us what that term sheet said, if they're not going to make that term sheet public, can they at least tell us whether or not they actually kept their side of the agreement or were there terms that the government actually failed to meet? Acting premier. There are ongoing discussions, Mr. Speaker, with the proponent and others. We'll continue to do what's necessary. Uh, the member opposite knows fully well the sensitivities around these discussions and these negotiations. We have always stated, and the federal government needs to partner in these initiatives. There are billions of dollars of opportunity available to us. The feds have not come forward with support for Ontario, which we need in order to take advantage of these mineral deposits. So we will continue to do our part, as I've stated already, and I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that the opportunities continue to exist because there's so much more interest still available to uh, to the area, Mr. Speaker, and we'll try to develop as best we can. Thank you. New question. The next the question third is also for the acting premier, Speaker. Transportation infrastructure is a huge challenge for bringing jobs to the Ring of Fire. Can the acting premier confirm that the government signed a commitment around creating a road? And if so, what was that commitment, Speaker? Good. So the development of the Ring of Fire. Is, uh, is, is going to require a lot of input from the federal partners, from the Aboriginal First Nations people, from uh, the areas in, 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 in that's implicated, the municipalities. We recognize an all-weather road is going to be necessary to make it so. Uh, there's also going to be trans uh, uh, a lot of work in regards to energy uh, submissions, and we will continue to do that, but we're having those discussions, and in order for us to develop that, we need to have the partnership with the federal government as well. We'll continue to do our part. We've invested and we've actually started to highlight what's necessary. And the proponents recognize the potential. We will do our, be our best to uh, ensure that it's developed, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, people across Ontario were promised thousands of jobs. Those were this Liberal government's words, thousands of jobs. But when it comes to actually showing the public what the government did or didn't do to deliver on that promise, we can't get a straight answer. It's been clear that the Liberals have failed to put in place the framework needed to take advantage of the Ring of Fire. Whether it's energy, whether it's roads, or helping First Nations find common ground with business, the the government has failed on every single count. All the while, Speaker, though, all the while, Liberal ministers were holding press conferences and claiming that everything was just fine. Why can't the acting premier share some basic information about agreements the government signed on behalf of the people of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, our government is moving forward with development of the Ring of Fire. We are continuing to do that. We have developed, we have put forward a development corporation. We have discussions that are being made with First Nations, the Métis Nations, and the Aboriginal people. We have discussions with proponents uh, of various proponents, not just that, not just one. We are trying to persuade the federal government of the importance of this development, just as it's been important for the development of other regions of Canada, like Alberta like Newfoundland, like New Brunswick. Ontario deserves the same degree of attention and investment because there's $60 billion of opportunity, not only for Ontario, but for all of Canada. The member opposite is asking us to provide and, and divulge sensitive commercial uh, negotiations. That's improper, and that is exactly why they would put it at risk. We will not put our, our, our province, 
at risk in these discussions. We're going to do everything necessary to move forward with the Ring of Fire. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, we know that Glyphs is only one of several companies interested in the Ring of Fire, but now people are wondering how many other companies are having the same kind of trouble with the Liberals that drove away Glyphs. There, there aren't just mining jobs in Northern Ontario that are at stake here, Speaker. There are potential for processing jobs uh, and Order. refining jobs uh, that could mean jobs in Sudbury, jobs in Hamilton, jobs in Thunder Bay. But that requires a plan, Speaker. The government won't share the details of their bungle deal with Cliffs. Can the acting premier tell us uh, his plan to work with other companies in the ring of fire so that maybe Ontario can realize some of those jobs that the government likes to carp about? Mr. Speaker, it is essential that we take the opportunities that exist in the far north in a very pragmatic and strategic way. We've established a development corporation to look into the best way to provide value for Ontario. We've had ongoing discussion with a number of proponents. We are doing exactly what is necessary to provide for the smelting and the processing here in Ontario. We recognize the obvious that she is proposing. What's not, not, what's not so obvious is getting to that opportunity in a very essentially strategic and pragmatic way for Ontario. We need the federal government to partner with us on these initiatives as well. And I, re and I reaffirm the importance of that region to all of Canada Answer. as well as Ontario. We need to move forward in partnership on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question. Member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the acting premier, uh, premier. We have cleared the legislative decks so you can finally bring out your plan to create and stimulate the economy. Instead, what do we get? A 1-800 number for pets and a new no-smoking policy. High taxes, mounds of red tape and triple hydro rates do not provide an open-for-business climate. Your lack of vision and hope has sent Ontario businesses packing. Extrata Copper, Caterpillar, U.S. Steel, Heinz, and now Cliffs Resources pulling out of the greatest opportunity in a generation, the Ring of Fire, all gone. Will you finally admit that you're taking us down the wrong path and adopt the PC party plan to bring jobs Question. and wealth back to the province of Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Was much better. Ah, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the member opposite uh, wants to, to Im give the impression that the people of Ontario and all the businesses that continue to invest in Ontario, the work that is being done to promote our economic recovery, which by the way exceeds all other jurisdictions around the world, including North America, he's putting them down, Mr. Speaker. Our people are working hard. We are trying to partner as much as we can to promote that economic growth. Their answer? Cut everything. Yeah. Slash it all. Take it away because they don't believe in investing in our people, investing in infrastructure, and supporting businesses, that is not deserving of their approach. It is of ours. We believe in the people of Ontario and in the business of Ontario. That's why we'll invest in them, and that's why we'll take these initiatives to support them. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Acting Premier. It's not as if these jobs that are leaving Ontario are disappearing completely. They're just disappearing from Ontario. They've been resurfacing elsewhere. Extrata Copper, 670 jobs over. resurfaced in the province of Quebec. Caterpillar has resurfaced in Indiana. Heinz in Ohio. Will you wake up over there? The jobs and investment are fleeing Ontario. The business world is sending you a very clear message. Stop blaming it on the recession. The other provinces have recovered. The U.S. is on recovery, and now these guys are eating our lunch. Don't you think you've created enough jobs for the United States? Thank you. Excuse me. I, uh, I'm not seeking quiet for the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke to add his two cents worth. He does that enough. Thank you. Minister of Finance. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite suggests that we should wake up. I would say to him, wake up and recognize the importance that Ontario has made and done for the people and for the businesses of Ontario. We've actually exceeded those very jurisdictions that he's just talked about, and we will continue to do that. My question to him, however, is why are you not supporting small businesses with the act that we brought forward, the bill that we brought forward to support them? You're holding that up. They are creating uncertainty, and that hurts small businesses. That's creating more red tape, and this is about cutting their taxes. So wake up and support small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Your question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Speaker, 740 people will be out of work in Leamington, and 46 area tomato growers will lose a significant contract because of this government's inaction on preserving and protecting Ontario jobs. Inaction on reducing industrial hydro rates, inaction on creating real incentives for capital investment, inaction on training. The list of what this government hasn't done to create and preserve jobs is endless. When is this go government going to get serious about preserving good-paying jobs that are the lifeblood of Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we are working to create jobs in this province. The Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, Eastern Ontario Development Fund alone have created and retained more than 22,000 jobs since their creation. Our Youth Jobs Initiative. The Youth Employment Fund, which is an employer incentive, has already resulted in just a couple of months more than 3,000 placements for young people in this province. We, we, the, we, with our investment with the Ford Motor Company as well, just a couple of months ago, a $70 million investment by the province along with the federal government is creating, retaining almost 3,000 jobs at that location. In fact, our auto sector is having the best year on record in terms of sales in Canada. We've created in the auto sector, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, about 15,000 net new jobs since the bottom of the Session. And of course, that's part of the five, nearly 500,000 jobs, not in the public sector. Answer. As the PCs would like to say, 100% of those jobs are full-time jobs. 80% of those jobs, Mr. Speaker, are in the private sector. Thank you. Supplementary. The speaker, the, the words "too little, too late" come to mind when I listen to the minister's response. 300,000 manufacturing jobs have been lost while this government has been sitting idly by rather than getting industrial electricity costs under control. For years, one jurisdiction after another has implemented targeted tax credits for investment training, job creation, while this government has done absolutely nothing. The Premier's admission that more job losses are coming is extremely worrying for people across Ontario. When is this government going to table a real job creation plan to begin to make up for the 300,000? 300,000 good paying jobs that have left this province under their watch. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite focuses on the 300,000 job losses in the manufacturing sector over the last decade. We, we, we believe in our manufacturing sector. We believe in the nearly one million people that are working in that sector today. It's a different sector, oh, Mr. Right. Speaker. It's changing. We know that the global circumstances are challenging, and we're adapting to those circumstances as well. The Premier, the, the, the member from Windsor West and myself were in Leamington on Friday. We met with the local leadership, business leaders, union representatives of the, the individuals involved to work with them to develop a plan to hopefully save that opportunity that is so important for that community in Leamington. So we are investing our, in our communities, and I think it's important that all of us in this legislature not denigrate our manufacturing sector, but speak about the possibilities and the opportunities and the expansion that is taking place, and we look for ways to continue to and help, sir. including in, improving and increasing their trade overseas. Thank you. Your question? The member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. This morning, I've got a question for the Attorney General. In September, the minister announced that a tentative settlement had been reached in the Huronia Regional Centre class action. Some of the former residents of Huronia would like to access their files so they can apply under the settlement. Speaker, would the minister please tell the House how these former residents may be able to get access to the files they need? Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And as uh, you know, we've uh, reached a tentative settlement that we hope will be finalized on December the 3rd. It's before the courts right now, and we believe that the 
settlement is a fair and reasonable one for all concerned, and we have acted to ensure that the residents of Heronia will be, have access to their files as soon as possible. As a matter of fact, I've strongly directed my ministry officials to work with the Ministry of Community and Social Services to make sure that those records will be available to those individuals that have suffered enough in their lives. Speaker, that's happening as we speak. Uh, those directions were given uh, some time ago, and I know there's some concern about that, but we will make sure that every resident will get the access to the records that they want. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I thank the Attorney General for that answer, obviously. But, Mr. Speaker, I understand that this settlement is going to go before the courts on December the 3rd for the court's approval. I know that former residents of Huronia want access to their personal information and files as quickly as possible. Those seeking their information sometimes don't seem to know where to go and uh, are being told their files may be kept in different parts in different ministries of the government. This, to me, seems to be pretty... Uh, unfair, it seems to be unduly complicated, and it makes life very difficult for these residents. So, Speaker, would the minister please tell us when will the former, when will the former residents be able to begin to access their files? Thank you. Attorney General. First of all, the former residents have to be an integral part of the settlement process. That's absolutely necessary. Uh, they can contact. They have one contact that they can uh, make through the Ministry of uh, Community and Social Services. If they can contact Kate Parker at 416-327-6101 uh, for assistance in accessing their records, those records will be made available without any fees being charged at all. They are entitled to their records. Instructions have been given that those records be handed over to those residents. Speaker, we are doing whatever we can in order to make sure that the tentative settlement that was reached in. Uh, uh, September will be finalized on December the 3rd because this case we have will be a template speaker with respect to the other similar settlements that we hope to uh, arrange with respect to the Southwest Regional and Rideau Regional. These people have a right to know and have a right to the access to their records. Thank you. New question. The member from Chatham, Kent Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Last week, the Premier visited Leamington after Heinz announced it would be closing the plant. The Premier announced a small amount of money with no plan. In fact, she made an announcement in Windsor before telling the people of Leamington. I know the Premier doesn't know much about rural Ontario, but Windsor is almost an hour from Leamington. The Premier's visit has done little to reassure the thousands of workers, growers, and all the families affected by the closure. One warehouse operator told me that he'll lose over a million dollars because of the closure. When I invited the Premier to Leamington in an open letter, I thought she was going to meet with the people, the real people, affected by the Heinz leaving town. Instead, she staged a photo op with dignitaries. Will the Premier apologize for last Friday's photo op and apologize to the people of Leamington for liberal policies Question. that are devastating my rural town? Thank you. Minister Frank. Economic Development and Trade and Employment, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't believe what I'm hearing from the, from the member opposite. And I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker, because last week, when I became aware that the Premier and I would be meeting with the good people, and, the, and obviously the member from Windsor West, with the good people of Leamington, with the political leadership, with the union representatives, with business people of the, on the farm side and the non-farm supply chain, when I became aware of, aware of that, I immediately went to the member opposite and invited him to that meeting. And that meeting that he attended was obviously important enough to him to attend that meeting, and now he's describing it as a photo op. Because he was happy to be part of that photo op, Mr. Speaker, and that meeting, which was so important to announce communities and transition funds, which is a first step, that first $200,000, so we could collectively develop a plan for that community so they could see their way forward. Supplementary, please. Again, to the acting premier, the impact that the closure will have on Leamington's Minister. economy is massive, but nowhere close to the pain being felt for the families of Heinz employees. In Leamington, it's common for many generations of families to have worked for Heinz. Retired employees collecting their pensions from Heinz are worried about what happens next. 
Folks who are about to retire are worried about their future. Yep. Leamington's young people who were just starting their careers or saving up for school will be forced to look elsewhere. Families are scared, and they're pulling up roots and are leaving Ontario. You owe them an apology. Acting Premier, will you and the Premier apologize for crushing the hopes of Leamington's young people and for, and for driving families away from Question. Ontario? Mr. Mr. Speaker, on this side, we're not going to apologize for working hard on behalf of the people of Leamington. And we expect that the member opposite apologizes for that comment. He knows, he knows completely well that before that announcement was made, I was on the phone with the mayor of Leamington. I've spoken with him numerous times. My staff have been in touch with the member opposite probably on a daily basis, Mr. Speaker. And that meeting last Friday was so important to the people of Leamington. We need to take the politics out of this. We need to make sure that we're providing everything we can for the people of Leamington. I know how devastating it is to that local community, not just for the workers at that factory, but for the entire community and the people who work on the farms that supply are part of that supply chain and the non-farm people. I'm committed to doing everything right humanly on. possible to helping those people, and I expect the member opposite to do the same. Right on. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Unlicensed daycare inspections in Ontario have revealed a troubling number of violations. Children sleeping in damp, airless rooms, in soggy bedding, or sitting in broken, unsanitary high chairs. What's worse, on November the 13th, there was another reported death of a nine-month-old toddler in an unlicensed daycare in Markham. This death, along with the death of Eva Ravikovic in Vaughan this year, and the many others before her are a troubling example of the policy this government is following in regards to unlicensed daycares. Inspecting only when there's a complaint is too late and is resulting in tragic deaths. When will the minister act and provide some oversight of unlicensed daycares Question. in Ontario so that parents can be sure that when they send their children to, to daycare that day, that they will be well cared for? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I don't think we've had a question since uh, the, uh, the, the unfortunate death of the little baby girl. And I can't think of anything more devastating than to lose a, an infant. So our heart does go out to the parents in, in this circumstance. Um, I, and in that particular case, uh, I understand that the uh, that the uh, police automatically investigate whenever there is an infant death. We have not received any, um, and my Ministry of Education um, officials have been uh, working with the police and the coroner's office in that investigation. Uh, we have no further information, and obviously it is a matter that's uh, actively under investigation Answer. to try and determine the cause of death, but we certainly uh, do look forward to uh, tabling new you. legislation, which will. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister of Education. Minister, there were 300 complaints to your ministry about unlicensed childcare in the year before two year old Eva Ravikovic died in an illegal home daycare found to be filthy and overcrowded in Vaughan last July. You admitted that your ministry had not followed up on all complaints, and now, while the Ombudsman is conducting an investigation into these serious allegations, another death of an innocent child. The time to act is now. Will you, as the minister responsible for these children, bring oversight to unlicensed daycares in Ontario instead of ignoring complaints? Minister. Thank you, and, and we, we have uh, worked with our complaints people since then and in terms of improving responsiveness to complaints, and in fact, we are in the process of setting up a dedicated enforcement team to deal with the complaints to make sure that there is consistency and quick response in terms of uh, reacting to the complaints. We have also are, are in the process of setting up a website so that parents can check and see when they look at a 
when they look at a web, uh, when they are considering a child care provider, that they can actually uh, check and see if there is any record of complaint against that particular uh, provider, uh, substantiated complaints. We are uh, in the interim. Uh, parents can call the Ministry of Education and check and see what, if they're considering a private home day Thank provider, you. whether there have been Thank any you. substantive. Your question, the member from Scarborough, Gildwood. Thank you, Speaker. I am pleased to rise in the House today. My question is for the Minister responsible for women's issues. Violence against women is a serious issue that does not discriminate. Its victims can be poor or rich, educated or not, of any background. Intimate partner violence has been consistently identified as one of the most common forms of violence against women. Sadly, Statistics Canada indicates that over 6% of Ontario women have experienced domestic violence in the past five years. It's important in my community of Scarborough Guildwood and across Ontario that the government continues to play an active role in preventing violence against women. Can the minister inform the House what has this government done to raise awareness and prevent violence against women? Thank you. Minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Scar Scarborough Guildwood for her question and her advocacy on this very important issue, one that we all know is still a timely issue that we continue to be engaged in. Mr. Speaker, today marks the United Nations International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. I'd like to thank all the members in the House for wearing white ribbons and showing their support for this important day. Our government believes it is every woman's fundamental right to live safely and securely in her home and community. And we backed up that belief with programs and policies aimed at ending violence against women. Our Domestic Violence Action Plan has raised awareness and strengthened both supports to victims and the justice system's response to these acts. Our Sexual Violence Action Plan works with community organizations to implement public education and training initiatives aimed at ending sexual violence. Answer. These important initiatives demonstrate our government's continuing commitment toward preventing women's abuse. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. I'm also pleased and would like to thank all members for wearing the white ribbons in show of support for ending violence against women, and hopefully it spawns uh, conversations that this must stop. I'm pleased to hear that our government has taken action to prevent domestic and sexual violence against women. I know that these initiatives are having a positive impact on our local communities. Unfortunately, these acts of violence still do occur. When they do, women need to know that there are supports available to help them in their time of need. Our government has an important role to play in supporting and providing supports for abused women with adequate levels of support. Minister, what is our government doing Question. to support women who have been victims of violence? Mr. Thank you again. And, and, and Speaker, we have taken action to strengthen support for women who are victims of violence. Since 2003, we have increased funding by 48 per cent for community services that help victims of domestic violence. The funding has helped serve close to 12,000 women and 8,000 children in emergency shelters just last year. We also continue to fund a program that provides employment training for abused and at-risk women. We know that economic security is closely tied to a woman's ability to leave an abusive partner. Since 2005, 1,800 women have built new lives for themselves and their families through this training. We've provided training to over 30,000 frontline workers to teach them how to recognize the signs of domestic violence. We know there's more work to be done, Speaker. We remain committed to this issue, to working with Answer. our communities, our agencies, our employers, to ensure that women remain safe. Thank you. Your question, member from Central North. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister, on Friday, we learned that CCL Containers and Penetang Machine is closing its doors and heading to Mexico. Another one. 170 more manufacturing jobs lost here in Ontario. It must be difficult for you to stand here every day and attempt to defend a government that only creates jobs in the public sector. So my question, so so, Minister. Minister, we have to stop the exodus of good manufacturing and mining jobs 
to our southern neighbours. It's that simple. So my question, Minister, is when will you think outside the box and create policies that will actually create employment in the private sector? When will you listen to Tim Hudak and, and a PC caucus and listen to our policies? Well, I appreciate the, the question from the member opposite. And, and with regards to CCL, uh, of course, this is uh, very difficult and unfortunate news uh, for the workers and the families that are affected by these layoffs. It always is, Mr. Speaker, and I think we should remember that if there's ever a time that we should be nonpartisan and make efforts to ensure that we do everything possible for these workers, including through uh, my colleague, the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities, to provide uh, job search and retraining opportunities for people across the province who unfortunately do lose their jobs. We need to invest in that. We need to, obviously, we, do, we need to, Mr. Speaker, continue to do everything that we can uh, to promote manufacturing in this province. I remind people in this legislature that there are roughly 800,000 people that are employed in manufacturing, and Answer. there are many cases where expansion is taking place and job creation is taking place, and that's contributing in part to the 500,000 full-time, 80 percent of them in the private sector, jobs that we've created since the bottom of the recession. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Minister, maybe you can explain that answer to the mayor of the town of Pentanguishines here today and to the 170 families that won't have a very Merry Christmas this year. Ridiculous hydro rates, along with the global adjustment, excessive red tape, and regulations in your environment and, and labour ministries, and, and the new boondoggle called the College of Trades is driving jobs and families away from our province. They should rename your ministry the Ministry of Job Losses and, uh, and Job Creation in Mexico and the USA. So with another 170 jobs going to Mexico, can you explain to the House today why any private sector company would ever set up in Ontario with your dismal policies? Yes, well, the difference between this side of the House and that, the official opposition, is we don't denigrate our manufacturers and the employees that work with them. We believe in supporting them, and in fact, the policy of the PC party back in 2008 was not to support the auto sector, and in fact, if the PC party had have had their way those years ago, we wouldn't have GM, we wouldn't have Chrysler in this province at all. The response to the policy of the PC party is a year ago when we voted to create the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund that together with the Eastern Ontario Development Fund has created and retained 22,000 jobs. That party opposite voted against it. The party opposite also voted against our $300 million youth job strategy, which has placed 3,000 people in jobs already. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm not taking any lessons from the party opposite. Their policy is to not vote for those, not to support our manufacturers, and not Thank to support sir. our employers. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for seniors. In 2010, the Liberal government assured Ontarians that their regulatory scheme for retirement homes would finally offer the protection that seniors desperately need. Yet, instead of moving forward with a strong system of protection, the government chose to bring forward a regulatory system that was filled with loopholes and problems. Seniors like those who are living at the in-touch retirement home continue to be the ones paying the price for this lack of oversight as the Toronto Star continues to document. Will the minister finally take action to protect these seniors? Minister responsible for seniors. Speaker, let me thank the member for uh, her question. Let me say this, that every senior in Ontario deserves to be living with dignity and respect in a safe and security environment. That is why the province of Ontario was the first one to regulate every retirement home in Ontario, Speaker. As of today, within some 700 retirement homes, Speaker, 689, they are already within the laws. They are operating with the proper license, Speaker. And let me say that the in-touch residential home was living completely out of touch. We have taken all the necessary action within the guidelines, the standards of the Retirement Home Act, Speaker. We have been on top of this House continually. That is why the Tribunal agreed with us to take away the laws from this particular House, Speaker. Answer. It is our belief, it is mine, it is the one of this government, Speaker, that every senior in Ontario deserves the best, and we are doing the very best because every house is being regulated, Speaker. Yeah. 
supplementary. Speaker, this government isn't doing their very best, and they are out of touch when it comes to seniors' issues. Speaker, the Toronto Star has been raising alarm bells about the fact that even when a retirement home operator loses its license, there is still nothing in the legislation that allows follow-up of this order or smooth transfer of residents to a better home. The Retirement Home Authority's Registrar Beth, Mary Beth Valentine is quoted in the Star as saying, there is little there is a problem, there is a clear problem with the legislation in that it does not require follow-up and it does not put us in a and it does put us in a more difficult situation. Does the minister have a plan to protect these vulnerable seniors or will he allow them to languish in, to languish in unsafe conditions or even face homelessness? Thank you. Minister. <coughs> Speaker, it is very sad that after everything we have done for our seniors with the legislation that we have introduced and passed. We, have, we were the first problem to introduce legislation to uh, combat elders' abuse. We have instituted a zero policy. We have uh, approved and installed in every retirement home the, the Seniors' Bill of Rights, Speaker. It is very sad. That is why the tribunal, Speaker, has agreed with us. And this shows, Speaker, and it's sending a very strong and direct message to every member of the House and to every retirement home out there that our system, our laws are working, Speaker, and that is why we are here today to protect our seniors. I will continue to take a look at the present legislation, Speaker. May not be the best in the world, but let me remind the member and every member of this House, Speaker, that is very freshly has been in operation merely yes, one year, and we have come a long way in providing our seniors with the best protection there is, and we are very proud and I'm very Thank proud you. that we'll continue to provide the best care for our seniors whenever they are. Thank you. No questions. The member from Scarborough, Asian Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government Services. Modern technology makes it possible to share ideas and information faster than ever before. In my riding of Scarborough Aging Court, I regularly hear from residents talking about the need for governments to engage with public in an entirely new and more meaningful ways. Speaker, it is my understanding that improving the citizenship, citizenship engagement and increasing dialogue with Ontario residents is a priority by this government. In October, the Premier and the Minister of Government Services announced our Open Government Initiative and as part of this initiative, the engagement team will be traveling Ontario hearing from the citizen. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he describe the engagement process, some of the places the team will be visiting, and the work has been done to date by the team? Thank you, Minister of Government Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Good Speaker. Question. I thank, uh, I thank the member question. for uh, her question. It is very important that uh, we look at new ways engaging in engaging Ontarians on uh, many of the challenges that are facing our province. As members know, uh, through the Premier, we invited renowned experts and innovative thinkers to be part of the Open Government Engagement Team. The team members were chosen because of their individual expertise and talent. No, I'm now, they are engaging with the public in a variety of ways, including using digital tools and traditional face-to-face -face town hall meetings around the province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, one of these meetings is being held today at Ryerson University here in Toronto. The Open Government Engagement Team will meet in the digital media zone from 6 to 9 p.m. People can register for the event at opengov at ontario.ca or they can just show up. These consultations will help inform Answer. the team's report, which will include recommendations for the implementation of open government initiatives in Ontario, and we hope to make the uh, report yep. public next spring. Very good. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank the Minister for that response. It looks like Ontario is embracing open government. This will mean our government will be more responsive and accessible to the people of this province. And all across the province, the residents are pleased to see government be more open, accessible, and responsive. Speaker, I understand the open government engagement team is made up of leading thinkers, innovators, and members of the tech community. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he share with the House the credentials of the engagement team members? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have a very talented uh, group, including Dr. Don Lenahan. He's the chair of the team. He's an internationally recognized expert on democracy and public engagement, accountability, and service delivery. He is an advisor and educator to senior public servants and a prolific author. Another member, Leslie Church, leads global communications and public affairs oh, for Google people. Canada. David Eaves, another member, works wow. with companies and government David's on strategy Starling. and innovations. He's been invited to speak or consult to organizations like like Code for America, 
the White House Presidential Innovation Fellows in the World Bank. Of course, members will know Norm Sterling, oh, a former Sterling. member of this legislature, cabinet There's minister, man. and someone, Mr. Speaker, who is intimately involved in the development of our province's access to information Sterling. system. Ray Sharma, another member, is the founder and president of XMG Studio, Incorporated, Canada's largest independent mobile games developer. I don't have time here to describe all the members of the team, but I think you get the flavor of, uh, of who's on that team, and we look forward to their work and their report. New question. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. While the NDP continues to stand behind the Premier's wrong-headed approach to teacher hiring, the PCs stand alone in wanting a fair and transparent process that ensures that principals can hire the best teachers for our students. One principal from Sudbury says the following, I've had to hire people that I would have otherwise not selected. I've missed out on the chance to bring first-rate people in because they don't sit on the top five eligible candidates list. We're a small board, so word gets around quickly as to who is a five-star candidate and who is not. I find it counterintuitive that we would accept any policy that would inhibit us from putting who we assess to be the best possible candidate in front of our students. This is from a principal in Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Education tell Ontario's principals why she does not trust them to put the best students, best teachers in front of our students? Yes, thank you. And, and, uh we uh, actually value our principals. Our principals are absolutely key to the education system. When, when principals are uh, leading their schools, as you well know, Speaker, they are actually the key to turning around schools to make school, sure that schools have a safe and accepting school climate. And absolutely, the work that our principals do in schools are, are key. And in fact, we have worked with our principals over or, uh, the last six or eight months to come to agreements with our principals associations. We are currently doing a, a study with our principals on principal workload and professionalism. So uh, we, in fact, Speaker, have a very Answer. warm relationship with our principals. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, since the minister doesn't think that principals are up to the job, she should listen to parents. Yeah. One principal from Ottawa yes, writes the following regarding That's Regulation 274, and I quote, Parents are justifiably angry. They have no patience for the length of time it takes to fill a vacancy. HR cannot keep up with the demands this mandate puts on them. Yeah. Minister, it might surprise you, but parents want to be uh, able to have the say in how, which teachers are in front of their, in their, their kids. The collective bargaining process that you've outlined in Bill 122 shuts out the concerns of parents. Right. Parents know what be what's best for their children, yet you're not giving them an outlet uh, to express their concerns through their MPPs. This is not simply about your stance on Regulation 274. It's the message that your stance sends to parents, principals, and new teachers alike. Minister, reconsider that stance. Question. Repeal Regulation 274, or the PC Caucus has no reason to support Bill 122. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister of Education. Thank you. And now we get to the heart of the matter. We have the government opposite that's on or the party opposite that's on record as saying that they don't want to work with unions, refusing to support collective bargaining relationship that will uh, legislation that will improve the re relationship with both employer boards and unions. So we now get to the heart of it. And they're hiding behind Reg 274, which might my critic says we snuck into legislation. Again, I think they have a challenge with reading, Speaker, because the legislation which they supported said that it would implement the MOU signed with OECTA, and if they would read the MOU that was signed with OECTA, they would have seen that it had the wording in Reg 274 Answer. embedded in it. They voted for it. A new question, the member from Trinity East Medina. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of uh, Consumer Services. Terrible. Most of the Tarion Warranty Corporation's funding comes from Ontario's homeowners, but Tarion does not answer to consumers. It answers to the developers it is supposed to regulate. Tarion spends consumer money on lawyers in order to fight consumers at the License Appeal Tribunal while protecting builders. Tarion has a CEO and a COO and nine vice presidents but as far as we can tell, 
zero proper building inspectors. The average compensation of Tarion is over $100,000 per year, and Tarion even uses consumer enrollment fees to host an annual awards banquet that celebrates builders. Wow. My question is, is Tarion another question. orange? And if not, will the government make Tarion open up its books and prove it? Yeah. So I thank the member opposite for the question, and I just want to acknowledge, and I believe the member opposite knows, that Tarion has made substantial changes to its operations right and consumer protection in recent years. But I do acknowledge, Speaker, there's always room for improvement, and I expect Tarion to continue to look for ways to improve customer service. It has committed to providing new ways to be uh, transparent, increase the value information they provide. I've met with Tarion leadership. And Speaker, it's very important to note that very recently, Tarion made changes to its operations. In fact, it changed the board composition such that it's now equal to industry and consumer reps. Right, and that's great. Uh, I'll continue to work with Tarion very closely to make sure uh, that they provide the best possible uh, customer service to to uh, their clients, Answer. people who are warranted uh, under this program. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, supplementary. The only change this government has made in 37 years, seven or eight years ago, was to add four appointees by the government. That's the only change you made. Nothing else has happened. It's still controlled by developers. Tarion is the only delegated authority with the power to create its own regulations without government approval. The only one. The province forces home buyers to buy warranty protection from Tarion, but does nothing to ensure consumers get value for their money. The Ontario Ombudsman cannot investigate Tarion, and the Auditor General cannot investigate Tarion. When will the minister reform Tarion into an agency that protects consumers instead of builders? Thank you. Speaker, um, my understanding is that when the NDP were in power, they did nothing to reform yeah, Tarion. So, so, so let's look at what this government has done to reform Tarion. We formed a new Consumer Advisory Council, Speaker. We created uh, the role of the new home, home buyer ombudsman person to create an independent review for homeowners, and we made changes to the major structural defect warranty in the three to seven year category. And, Speaker, the member knows as an independent, not-for-profit corporation that does not receive government funding, the new Home Warranty Act does not provide the authority to request an audit. However, however, Speaker, if the legislature, this legislature determines that the Auditor General should be asked to provide a third-party audit of some kind, I will, of course, respect the will of the exactly. legislature, and I will fully welcome recommendations of the report. Thank right you. On. Thank you. Great. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.